Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you on behalf of the Hamdan Medical Journal to a talk about urinary incontinence. Urinary incontinence is not something you die of. It's not a dangerous disease. But, as a patient uh, rightly found out, it can deprive you of your life. It bears down on your quality of life for its social consequences. You can change the view sometimes if you change the perspective. Urinary incontinence is important in medicine in that it is very, very prevalent. Mostly females are concerned here. And in a very well done uh, study that was population based and went through all the age groups of uh, females uh, in the United States, they found out an overall uh, urinary incontinence rate of 15%. They also looked for fecal incontinence and found out they were 9% and 3% for uh, pelvic organ prolapse. So that are staggering figures if you compare them to other uh, more dangerous diseases. And if you compare them to diseases like asthma or diabetes, you can see the problem of a overactive bladder, which is detrusor instability and can be associated with urinary incontinence too. You can see how this, uh, uh, these figures compare with other uh, problems. So why don't we see more of these patients in our medical practices? This is because most of the patients are ashamed. They are embarrassed. There is a taboo. And in a recent study, uh, we did a survey on patients and found out that compared to other diseases like depression and cancer, the patients were most embarrassed by an incontinence problem. So it is very important to show this and to work on this in a society. This is a very brave woman. It is a patient of mine who came out with her incontinence problem live on television recently in Austria. She was the first one to do so. And I hope that she will be not the last. So what are the risk factors? The main risk factor for incontinence, of course, is age. And as you can see in this uh, epidemiological study from Norway, uh, it increases with age very much. So you will find more incontinent patients uh, the more you step up with your age ladder. And what about age? What is, what is this? What is what are the populations doing? This is a very uh, interesting uh, program uh, at the University of Sheffield. Um, they try to map epidemiological data on physical maps of the world. Here you can see the physical maps, and let's focus on Australia here. And this is when you map population on this map. So look how huge India or China becomes here and you can barely see Australia on this map. So that's very interesting and what about the elderly population? Here you can see a look into the future. Here you can see how the elderly people are concentrated here in Europe, in Asia and also of course in the Middle East. So when you try to, um, to look at the incontinence problem increasing with age and see those figures going up, uh, then you can easily see that we have an increasing problem here with incontinence. I would like to dedicate the rest of my talk to the management of incontinence. The up-to-date management of incontinence is an evidence-based consensus and it is actually very easy to do and it has to be 
very easy because many, many patients need management for incontinence. So it is divided up into history, clinical assessment, and then you arrive at a presumed diagnosis, and then you can start off with conservative management. So that's the principle. Um, this uh, diagnostic pathway um, splits up the incontinence in the three main groups you see. Incontinence on physical activity, which is associated with uh, low pressure in the urethra. Incontinence with frequency and urgency, which is due to an overactive detrusor. And then, of course, mixed incontinence, where you find both of the symptoms uh, in one patient. It is important to rule out dangerous diseases like uh, bladder cancer, for instance, or diseases uh, after uh, treatment in the pelvis, operative treatment, irradiation treatment. Uh, those patients go on to specialized management, but the remainder of the patients can go on to conservative treatment, and therefore it's very, very important to have treatment options for these uh, patients ready. And one of the most important treatment is pelvic floor exercises. This is the man who uh, first came up with the idea of training the pelvic floor muscles. His name is Arnold Kegel and he came up with the idea in 1948. He found out that the uh, pubococcygeous muscles are muscles like any other muscle in the body. The problem uh, is that it is hidden. So you cannot see the action right away, like in this woman who are, is doing her push-ups. Um, you have to palpate or you have to assess the, 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 the action of the pelvic floor muscles uh, by um, by, um, by a biofeedback uh, method. So this is very important and we know from many, many randomized studies that pelvic floor exercises are effective. They, are, um, they have an effectivity rate of about 60 percent. So that may not seem to be very much uh, compared to surgical methods, but uh, you don't have any complications and you don't have side effects from this form of treatment. So what if uh, women do not, uh, if women fail conservative treatment, they of course go on to other forms of treatment like medical treatment or um, surgical treatment. Uh, the workup in these uh, patients is more complex of course, but then again let me remind you that if you do a conservative treatment first, you end up with only 40% of the patients for specialized treatment, which are con uh, candidates for medication or surgery. So after having done your specialist uh, workup, you go on to surgical treatment, and surgical treatment, the, the standard treatment now is synthetic meat urethral slings, and these are put um, with this introducer on both sides of the urethra and place a synthetic sling just below the middle of the urethra um, to support the urethra and to give support during phases of stress. So if the patient coughs and if she works out, uh, then uh, in 80% of these cases the incontinence will be um, will be just fine. They uh, don't have, they don't only have the retropubic approach, but also a transobturator approach, uh, which uh, does not injure the bladder. Um, so bladder injuries are reduced in these kinds of surgeries. This is a, a, a missing YouTube video. Um, it is blocked in this system, like in many academic settings. So I want to encourage you to go to YouTube because you, uh, 
will find um, many videos, in fact, that you can use for learning and teaching purposes. Of course, not everything is useful for teaching and learning at YouTube. Uh, we can agree on that, but um, YouTube is um, in many ways uh, very important. This is a new development and our uh, university um, now uh, does um, prospective randomized placebo controlled um, trial um, where skeletal muscle is biopsied and then stem cells, adult stem cells are prepared from this biopsy and transferred into the urethral wall with this sophisticated technique where an ultrasound machine uh, localizes the sphincter, the urinary sphincter, and the stem cells are transported into the sphincter and we are very hopeful uh, to find a new um, not so invasive kind of treatment in the future for our patients to spare them um, surgery. So to conclude, uh, let me remind you that female urinary incontinence is a very, very prevalent condition. It still is a social taboo and a source of shame and embarrassment. Risk factor age is very important and therefore in the future we will see uh, an increase of incontinent patients in aging populations. But it is easy to diagnose, not too difficult to treat and please remember conservative treatment always comes before more invasive treatment. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>